Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Lord, we thank you for each person that's here today or listening online. And Lord, we just pray that you would open up our eyes to see what you have for us today. Lord, you know us individually. You know the problems that we face, the challenges. But Lord, you, uh, you also know the answer to those problems. And we just pray now that you would help us to know more about Jesus. Pray that you'd use Pastor Izzy to, uh, to speak to each one of us this morning. And we also pray for your blessing on the Harvest America. Pray that uh, you'd give Greg glory and all the all the the bands and uh, everybody working there. Lord, we pray that you would you would bless that whole event, and we pray that most importantly you would be in the business of changing lives today. We pray Amen. for a great revival in our country, and we ask that now in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Amen, Amen guys. Well, this morning we're going to continue our study in the book of First John. It's near the end of your Bible. There's three little epistles: First, Second, and Third John. These are not the Gospel of John, but they're the same writer. And so we're going to pick up where we lo- left off last week. We got all the way to verse 5. I set a blazing pace and blistering. J- my wife inching through the words. You see her over there going, nah, 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 and this is Izzy. But um, hey, this is some sweet stuff. I mean, we're, we're at the part here what John has declared he was the not only eyewitness to, to Christ coming, but he was also, he says, that his hands had touched. He had actually physically, and I mentioned this last week, but, you know, like Doubting Thomas, the guy that some people laugh at, who I'm grateful was in the story. Thomas was the guy that he he said, I'm not going to believe you guys. Now, this I always laugh about this because, you know, when you think of the 12 apostles, you think that they would trust each other enough, right, after three years of following Jesus together, that they would have had it together and they would have been like, yeah, you know, the other guy said it must be, yep, Christ is risen. I, I heard it from Matthew. John confirmed it. You know, um, all the guys are saying it. And, and Thomas, who wasn't present when Jesus was there the first in his first appearance to the, to the apostles, um, he's like, I don't believe you guys. And I, don't, and I won't believe you until I do what? Until I take my finger and stick it. And then they told him in the holes in his hands. We know it's him because he's got the holes in his hands and the holes in his feet and the, and the hole in his side where they shoved that spear in. Though this week I got uh, b- treated to go see this movie, Risen. It's in our theaters about Christ's resurrection from the standpoint of the centurion guard, the, the one in, in charge of overseeing the, um, the platoon kind of leader of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the Roman Empire that was there at the time. And the whole discourse, the whole story is given from his perspective. He's told, go find this body because all of a sudden it went missing. And um, his fellows that are supposedly, you know, trained guards, they didn't keep up their guard. And so it shows the whole goings on of the lying that went on and the paying off of, the Bible tells us, by the way, that, that the religious leaders actually came to the Roman soldiers and said, just tell everybody that his disciples came and stole the body away. And if anything should happen, you know, they, because if you're a guard and you don't keep your post, for those of you like myself, raised with military, um, you know, now what happens to guys that don't keep their post? Yeah, I mean, th- this, is, this is punishment time. In the Roman culture, the punishments were a little bit swift and um, brutal. If you didn't keep your post and you were guarding someone and, and, their, and their sentence say was, uh, whatever the sentence was upon them was now transferred to you. That was the Roman justice. So if the sentence was death and you, didn't, and, and you let the guy get away, he was on death row, you let him get away, then they put you to death. These guys were commissioned to guard the body of a dead man already. And don't make, let anyone break the seal that was on the stone rolled in front. And I like the movie show that, that the, the ropes that they had put, the Romans put ropes over it and seals and everything. And, and, they, and they mentioned that the ropes didn't look cut. Instead, of they looked like something had exploded, pushed, and just shredded the ropes, just made them and just blow open. 
And I thought that was an interesting touch. But near the end of the movie, they, and by the way, they do show Jesus resurrected, which is cool. You know, he, he's there sitting in the midst of his disciples and, and, and then no Thomas in the first time that he's there. And, but this they show the scene the next time. And when, when Thomas comes in and sees Jesus, Jesus just pulls the sleeve like this, go ahead. Like putting your finger in there. But the only problem was this Hollywood. They could have done a better job. They, they actually showed, l- it looked like scars closed up. Instead of holes, like hole all the way through and, you know, hole in the side. Because he does lift the shirt and says, here, look, the hole that was, l- but it looks like a scar. It looks like it's closed up already. And the scripture says that Thomas didn't just look at a scab or a closed hole. He reached his finger, it says, where? Into the hole in his hands and into his hand, into his. Now, I mentioned last week, but those of you that are into anatomy and physiology, would that have been a trip that day to, to just be there and see the resurrected Lord with holes in him? This is why I like this book better than the movies. For some reason, they got it. I wish they would consult with me on some of these scripts <laughs> because somebody has not taken time to learn the good book. And Hollywood falls short. Don't get your theology from Hollywood, okay? You're going to miss out on some of the real subtle sweetness of the gospel. As we're going to study today, John says, I was there. My hands touched him. Concerning the word of life, I was an eyewitness, but I didn't just see I touch. And I, he didn't say I. He said what? We there was more than one that saw Christ resurrected, more than one that touched him. And, and it wasn't like, oh, he, it was a ghost risen. They actually touched him. For those of you that don't know the, the scripture real well, let me just acquaint you with a passage in the end of the Gospels. When, uh, when, when Christ was resurrected, he was on the shore. And um, he said, right, right when he first, well, when he's first resurrected, he said, do you guys have something to eat? Remember this? And, and they said they gave him some fish. And he ate it in their presence. Now, what happened? Did the fish go into him and then fall through him like Casper the ghost, you know, and drop on the ground? And you know, I remember when I was a kid, I always thought that was funny when I watched Casper. He'd try to eat something, and, and it would just go in his mouth and then drop out the bottom. And he, he couldn't keep it in because he was a spirit, right? The spirit has no body to eat. But Jesus, why would he do that? Why would he eat in front of them? To show them. It's me resurrected. And we have a peculiar saying in the scripture that is recorded for us. That it says Christ was resurrected flesh and bone. Not flesh and blood like we're used to saying. But flesh and bone. Why does it say flesh and bone? Because he's got big holes in his hands and a big hole in his side. Big holes in his feet. And where did his blood go? It was shed. It was shed for us. Now, this is the whole, I mean, this is what shows the marvelousness of the whole gospel message. That Christ became the perfect lamb of God to take away our sins. And when he did that, when he came to take away our sins, it cost him. It cost him his very blood. Now, I was explaining this to the kids because they're like reading some Old Testament passages. And they're like, man, God was mad at animals. You know, they had to like. Confess their sin onto this animal and then slit its neck and bleed its blood and offer the blood as a sacrifice, right? And why was that? What, what, what were they taught was in the blood? The life. The life was in the blood. And the, the sin, the wages of the sin was what? Death. And the only way to cancel out the death that comes from our sin is to cover it with the life. The only thing that can cancel death is life. And so Jesus came. Now, all of that in the Old Testament, don't worry, God wasn't mad at the animals. The Bible says all this stuff that happened to the Jews in 1 Corinthians 10, it happened to them for our example. He's trying to teach us something. He was trying to show a foreshadowing. A, the Jews, by the way, they love this kind of stuff. They call it types and shadows of, of the things, what God's truth, what he's bringing out. He, he was foreshadowing the reality that every time you sin, that sin brings death. And every time you want to pay for that death, it it has to cost some life. And that's why this whole setup of sacrifice for sin was, was just a foreshadowing 
of the coming what God was going to do when he sent his son. That's why John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus, first thing he said in public, his public declaration of Jesus, behold the what? The Lamb of God who does what? Takes away the sins of the world. That guy is coming to take away our sin. See, and in the law, it said that the requirement to get rid of our sin was to have a perfect lamb. Problem is they were offering imperfect lambs. So the, the sacrifices weren't really taking away the sin. But it was all a, a foreshadowing, a foretelling of what God was going to do. He was going to send his son to take away our sins. And this morning, we're coming to a part in the gospel, or not gospel of John, in the epistle of First John, where John is going to explain some things. He said last week we got to verse 5, God is light. In him is how much darkness? None. There is no darkness in God. He's pure light. And John goes on now to verse 6. If you look with me at 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, it reads, If we say, now this is going to become the um, beginning of what, what I learned in Bible school, the seven false confessions of men. The things, what we, if we say this, well, here, watch out for these confessions. Let me show you what it says here. If we say what? If we say we have fellowship with him, and yet we walk in darkness, it says we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, it says we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, what does his blood do? It cleanses us of how much sin? I want you to make a little note here. Not of some sin, not of just our biggies, you know, and then we work off our little ones. By the way, some people actually adhere to teachings like this where, where Jesus really took care of the big stuff, but we need to take care of the little amends. No. This verse says, and this is from an eyewitness that was with Jesus, says his blood, it cleanses us from how much sin? All. If you teach any kind of twisting of this truth that you leave out that Christ's blood took care of all our sin, what you're doing right there is a disservice to the gospel. In fact, you're perverting it. You're changing the very essence. The, by the way, the word gospel means good news. If you say, well, Christ died for mostly our biggie sins, but we have to go to church to work off for the little things, and you know we need to do other spiritual obligations just to, to keep in God's favor. You know what you just did? You took the good news, the gospel, and you made it not gospel. There's no more good news. Because the, the good news is, John is declaring it. Christ came to pay for all of our sin. Not some, not most. Mostly if we're good and die on a good day. You know, I used to pray that I would die like on Saturday night. I know you're laughing at me, but when you're raised Catholic, Italian Roman Catholic boy, going to catechism and going to, to, to learn Latin mass and studying to be an altar boy, and you're taught that you know you, every week you, you get in this ritual of confessing your sin in a little box, by the way, a little, you go in one door and the priest goes in the other door and, you know, he's like a voice for God on the other side of the, of this little slidey thing. And <laughs> you guys are laughing at me. I can see it already. Look, some of you, how, how many of you ever did this, by the way? I just out of curiosity, just, okay, I, I, every Saturday, right? I always taught every Saturday, before we could have communion on Sunday, we had to go to confession on Saturday. And by the way, we're taking communion today. So I want to share with you some things that my misconceptions of my childlike mind, I, I kind of thought, well, you know, I, I have all week to sin and I only get to confess on Saturdays. So basically I'm racking them up till I get to Saturday and then I go into the box and, and I was in a, a parish called St. Teresa's in, in Phoenix, Arizona. And our, pr our priest, now this is mostly all Italians that went to this church, helped build, all, did all the masonry work, all the building of the buildings and everything. All the whole parish was put up by Italians. But we had a, we, he has a cracker. we had an Irish priest, Father McMahon. 
Now, if you're used to Italian thick accents all around you, everyone around you speaks, you know, English as a second language and not very good, and you go to confession and the guy behind the little black thing, which, by the way, I could peek through the little fabric and see who it was, you know. Kids, we're curious. We're not going to just sit there staring forward. No, we're like looking in. I can see you, Father McMahon. And we knew it was him anyway, because who has an Irish accent in a whole Italian church? I mean, it's just obvious. And we know who he is because he's up front, and I'm studying to be an altar boy. I'm holding the stuff behind him, right, during Mass. I know who it is. And this idea of confessing got me to think, man, I'm, I, without realizing this, I, I kind of got this mindset of a child thinking, it would be really good if I died on a Saturday night after confession, so that I don't have time to rack up too many bad things, so maybe God will let me in because, I would, God forbid, I would die on a Friday. I'd have all week to sin, and I didn't get to confession. And you guys are laughing at me, but I'm telling you, as a child, I was worried. What if I die on the wrong day and I didn't get to take care of the business, you know, the spiritual man? And nobody taught me. This is the, ir the, the irony of this, is that, first of all, who is our high priest, according to the book of Hebrews in the Bible? Jesus. The one who we're supposed to confess our sins to is him. And how much sin does he forgive? All. And is there uh, only a weekly check-in prescription here in the, in the Bible? It says, wait until Saturday to go to Mass and do your confess, Right? We can confess our sins biblically all the time. And I'm going to show you that this morning. John is going to point this out. Now, this is truly good news. Now, remember, John's writing this epistle way before the Catholic Church ever becomes the Catholic Church. You know, those of you who know church history, the Catholic Church doesn't become, well, Peter doesn't even become the first pope till 300 A.D. Poor Peter, he didn't even know he was the first pope. They, they, by the way, they retroactively made Peter the first pope in the Catholic. You can do your homework and find that out. He was not a pope like we see today. They just conferred that on him afterwards. And obviously they didn't read the story because, you know, the popes today aren't allowed to have wives. But we know Peter had a wife. You know how I know that? There's a story in the gospel that says that Peter's mother-in-law was lying sick with fever. And Jesus came in. And what did he do? To be, he healed her. I got a question. How do you have a mother-in-law without having a wife? So, I mean, she's named. The, the mother-in-law is pointed right, right out in the Gospels. And, and how do you come up with Peter gets to be the first pope, but all the popes don't get to have wives? Somebody forgot to read the book. I told you the book is better than some of the movies. It's better than some of the traditions what men have made up when they veered away from the book. Stick with the book. Let me show you this morning something in the book that I believe is one of the greatest things. Now, if we confess these things that are, well, I'll show you. He says in verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth, it is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. Or the King James is just. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of how much unrighteousness? I want you, you might have to break out your highlighter this morning because we're going to have a lot of all. He's going to cleanse you from all sin. He's going to take you and, and cleanse you from all unrighteousness, not some. You know, I remember hearing Raul Reese speak one day. He was, now, those of you who have never heard Raul Reese speak, he's a heavily accented Hispanic man. <laughs> Is that a good way to say it? And his <laughs> he's given this discourse one time. I remember he was studying to get his degree at Bible school, and it was like right after I think he got his, his, his one of his degrees, and he, he was like, <laughs> and the Greek word for all? And he started to think about it, and he went, oh, heck. All is all. That's all all means. 
You know, like he was going to give this discourse about the Greek word of all. And he doesn't forget it. All is just all. When it says he forgives you of all your sin, when he cleanses you of all your unrighteousness, how does that make you feel? I don't know about you, but I am, I am down with this. This is awesome. This is good news. This is what the good news is truly about. In fact, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 1, the very first chapter of the book of Isaiah. I want to show you a verse in verse 18. We actually, we'll sing this in a little bit. When we do communion, when we finish, I'd like to sing this song with you. Some of you already know this verse. Verse 18, Isaiah 1, chapter 1, the very first chapter of the great prophet Isaiah. He says this in verse 18. He says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as what? As snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them what? White like wool. I will take your sin. Though it be, I mean, blood, red, it is like scarlet. I remember as a kid, don't, don't get certain colored stains in your clothes because they're too hard to get out. This was one of the ones they told me it's not, not easy to remove, the, the, the scarlet stain. But though your sin be as scarlet, what's Jesus say he'll do? He'll make you white like snow. He will cleanse you of all your sin. Now, I don't know, but this is good news. This John says, I was an eyewitness to this fact. The word concerning life, the guy who came to give us everlasting life, he came to cleanse us of all our sin. And he said, all we have to do is confess. If we confess our sin. Now, by the way, we're not holding a confessional here on the beach today. We're not putting up a little box and you're going to come in and I'm sitting on the other. No way. First of all, I, I don't want you to confess your sin to me. I don't. I don't want to know how creepy you are. <laughs> Just tell the Lord, okay? Because, I mean, some of you, you got some sin. But so do I. You know, if we think about it, well, how many of us have sinned, according to the Scripture? All. Remember Romans 3? It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory. Not, it's not like we're special, you know, because we have a sin. All of us have sinned. The good news is that Christ came to take care of how much sin? All. All of our sin is taken care of in Jesus. When he shed his blood, this is why it was such a big deal that the gospel records that he arose from the dead, flesh and bone. Blood already shed. The Lamb of God had given his blood, the perfect Lamb that the Bible said would be the requirement of the true one that would come to take away our sin. The Messiah had to fit the bill. He had to be able to give of his blood and then rise from the dead without the blood. That's one of the things, you know, the kids are asking, so what if I want to pay for my own sin? I said, all you got to do is bleed all your blood into a bowl, offer it to God. One catch. You know the catch, right? You got to stay alive. After you do this, there's a little problem there. If I bleed all my blood into a bowl and offer it for a sacrifice, here, God, here's my offering. What happens to me? <laughs> I'm dead. And Christ, Christ, he, the law has that as a requirement. Did Christ fulfill that requirement? Did he shed his blood? Yes. And this is good news. But this shows the power of God unto resurrection. The power, that power, and by the way, Paul, when he writes to the church at Corinth, it's that power that resurrected Christ from the dead that changes, well, he says, that took us, and if we will use our minds, he said, and consider these things, we can, we can recognize Christ did that. Christ overcame death. He overcame all my sin. He overcame hell. He was a substitution. In fact, um, William over there teaching Sunday school taught last night to the college and career group. Christ in 2 Corinthians 5 became our substitute. Like he stepped in. He, Will's a 
By the way, he's a great student. He likes math and science and all that stuff, and real nerdy, and so am I. He was like, kids, I'm going to teach you about substitutions. I've been doing two hours of mathematics. Substitutions, you got to do all the time in equations. You substitute this, and then you put the value over here, and then you find out the answer. And, and he was going to explain with mathematics. You know what all the college-age kids did last night? Boo, poopa. We don't want any math substitutions um, lesson. Could, he, could you do something else? Movie references or something? Will did, by the way. He just switched on a dime. Okay, we'll do movie references. I'll show you how substitutions work. Turn, and he got me to put up on the big screen, Indiana Jones. In the when, when, when he's trying to get this little golden thing off of this thing, he's got a bag of sand, and he's weighing it out, trying to figure out how he's going to. He goes, that's a substitution. I said, that's pretty good. <laughs> you know, I, I, I wouldn't have been able to do that movie reference right off the top of my head. But he was ready, and he, he was pointing out that Christ was our substitution. If we were to pay for our own sin, we would be the ones on that cross shedding our blood. But Christ said, let me step in for you. I'll be your substitute. I'll take your sin and I'll bear it. And it says, he who knew no sin became sin for what? For us. That's the good news. I didn't do it. He did it. And Paul, uh, sorry, John says, I what I I was uh, I'm an eyewitness to this. I touched him. I saw this guy, and he says, "If we confess our sin, now who are we confessing to? To God. You go to God, and by the way, the Bible says there is only one mediator between God and man. This always used to trip me up in my early Christian faith because I had been taught my whole life there was a whole bunch of mediators between God and man. You know, being raised Catholic, we had the priest." We had like certain saints that we were taught were um, go-betweens for certain topics. Like we had one for, for, for tr travel mercies. That's uh, St. Christopher, right? You had to have your St. Christopher medal if you're going to go on a trip. And we had ones like the, the gals who wanted to, to um, have a baby. St. Maria Gretti, pray to her. You know, like you don't pray direct to God because he's a busy guy. So what you do is you, you talk to these certain saints that have already died and are, are up there. And then wh when they see the moments right, they'll slide in, you know, your request kind of thing. That's the way it, it was explained to us. So God's a busy man. A lot of requests, you know, just to keep things simple. If you got a, a request for, well, we had, we had saints for everything, basically. I mean, they have a whole list. Is that a scriptural teaching? You guys know that that wasn't taught in the Bible days, right? That crept along later into the traditions of church history and and you know just because it's taught as a tradition was jesus really into the traditions they had made up in the jewish stuff oh boy did he he came along and said you guys you have invalidated the word of god with your traditions they had made traditions of men that they had fashioned they sounded spiritual like thou shalt do no work on the sabbath so when Jesus comes and heals a woman who's been in bonds her whole life, she's all, you know, bent over, doubled over, and Jesus comes and says, be well. And she's straight and she's healed. And they tell Jesus, there is six days to do healing. This is the Sabbath. You should come on a different day to get healed, not today. I, I don't know about you, but I think that's a little can you imagine? What, what if Jesus healed someone today at our service? But we go, uh, you should come a different day. We're, 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 we're into doing our service right now, and you're interrupting. <laughs> Are you kidding me? What if they wheeled someone in a wheelchair? Their legs had never worked. And God, in his mercy, touched that person right here, right now, while we're having service. But you go, you know, you're interrupting the pastor's message. I'd be like, interruption, welcomed. Go God. I mean, who, but do you understand that in the days of Jesus, they were actually telling him to leave? Leave the temple. And Jesus said, this, this temple is my father's house. And 
My father's house, he says, is supposed to be a house full of what? Prayer for all nations. But you guys have made it a den of thieves. They were setting up shop and exchanging money and selling things like, here, let me sell you an animal for sacrifice. This lamb here has been inspected by the high priest. See the little ribbon? He has a seal. Oh, your lamb hasn't been inspected. I don't know if they're going to accept that. I'll tell you what. Give me a couple shekels in your lamb, and I'll give you this one. And they had a racket going. They give them this, quote, pre, you know, examined lamb ready for sacrifice. They take that one, go slap a ribbon around it. Next sucker comes along. Oh, you want to worship God? Here. Oh, you don't have a good lamb. Here, we've got one right here. Do you know that that's what they did in the days of Jesus? Did Jesus like that, by the way? He made a whip, drove them. He got mad. Get out. This is my father's house. It's supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. And you guys have turned it into mercy. I think, what do you think Jesus would do with some of the American churches when he walks into their foyer? And you're hit with all the stuff for sale, you know? We, we've merchandised the gospel, haven't we, in Western Christianity? We've lost the message of what it's... Now, I know that's not popular to teach. But see, we're way out in the island, so I can get away with it. Besides, I'm on a beach in Hawaii. And we don't have anything for sale. Do you know that? Nothing for sale. Everything we have here today is given freely. So we can share what the gospel really is. Good news. No charge. The charge, was, well, it was very costly. I'm not going to say it didn't cost anything. It's just that God paid the bill. And he paid it through his son that he gave as a gift. And John says, I saw it. I was there. My hands handled. We did, he says. Not just Thomas. He includes himself with Thomas. We saw this one, this word of life. And w when John is telling this, I, I have to think that maybe he was listening to Jesus talk a little. Since he was leaned up against his breast, right, at the Last Supper, just, you know, for all of eternity, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm envious of John. He, while he was, while Christ was on this earth, John was that close to Jesus. Anyone here would have liked to have been that close to Jesus? Like they said, so how close were you out of the 12? I was the one leaning on him. And by the way, you know what's interesting? When John, and I'll show you this when we get later into the, to this epistle, but and even repeated in his other writings, he will express something very interesting. He'll say, the disciple, now he writes in third person, the disciple whom Jesus, what? Loved, writes these things to you. Who's he talking about? Himself. There's so one thing I found out. If you draw close to Jesus... I mean, and you can do that, by the way, even today. Jesus said, more blessed are the ones. And even in the movie, I did like the movie Risen, where they put in the part that G and they had Jesus saying it to his disciples. You guys believe because you see, and I'm right here. But more blessed are the ones who will just hear this word and believe. You, you get to touch me. You get to see me. You get to, you know, firsthand know this. But more blessed will be the ones who just hear of this. And we're the more blessed, aren't we? He says that's what Jesus said about us. Now, I, I always felt less blessed because I wanted to be there with them. Actually, when I read about the times that they were living in, I'm not really sure I wanted to be there with them. You think about it, right? I was in the shower this morning. It was like 5 o'clock, 5.30, and I was thinking, the water coming out of our shower is warm. We have warm running water in the early morning. What, what time in all of the eras of man, unless you live by a hot springs, right? Because you get up and have a warm shower. Then you just turn a little dial. You didn't have to go fetch the water. You know, like out on the farm we had to pump. Any of you ever had to pump water up? <laughs> the kids look at me like, you are from Mars. You, d you didn't really have to do that, did you? I'm uh, like, Yeah. We had to dig the well, too. That was fun. And I was the skinny little kid. Guess who got to go down? Me. Yeah. 
You're small. Get in there. Fill up these buckets. Send them up. You know, when you're in a little hole and a bucket's going past you and bumping you and smacking you, and you think, this is fun. I'm so glad I'm small. I can't wait to get bigger. I'm never going down these holes. But the things that we take for granted, we have such an easy life. Those guys didn't get to have hot showers in the morning, running water, electricity. You know, the things that we just, ju just some of the things that, now my son Daniel's like, Dad, I wouldn't mind going back a little while <laughs> to, to a different era before they texted everything. So my generation doesn't even talk. They're in the car together texting. My, my sisters are texting from the third seat to the second seat in the van. Why don't they talk? They're right there. The girls are laughing. <laughs> Emoji this. Snapchat that. You know, doing their thing. Last night I saw them switching faces. There's a new app. They stand next to each other and they take a picture and the face of one of them switches over to the... And Daniel decided to switch faces with Dad. Came up to me, Dad, look into the camera. Yes, son, what's up? And, oh, nothing. And he starts laughing. I don't look any different. <laughs> he had dad's face in his body, you know, they switched it. He said, well, now you know what you look like when you get older. <laughs> You're stuck with this nose. It just comes that way, you know, it's genetics. Cruel master. But part of, <laughs> we, we have a lot to be thankful for that we're in this era. But we have some things that I think are disservice. That the gospel has become Um, not so much the gospel anymore. They they mixed in a bunch of little traditions and of men, and they weakened the good news from what it really. I mean, it, the good good news is that Christ came to cleanse me of how much sin? All, all, every single one. Now, verse ten is the third false confession. Just in these. This morning's study, there have been three confessions of men. If we say this, if we say this, if we say this. Here's the third one. By the way, there's seven in this whole letter, so I'm just getting you introduced to the first three this morning. You found eight? Good girl. Shh, don't tell anyone. Okay, if we say that we have not sinned. <laughs> have any of you run into someone who said they don't have any sin? There's their first sin. What, listen to this. It says, if we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar, and his word is not in us. Wait, we make him a liar? No, we're a liar. That's what I say. If we say we have not sinned, and by the way, are there ever people that confess, I don't sin. I don't have any sin. I'm like, you right there, you're, there's your sin. You're arrogant. You lie. The truth is not in you. Because the Bible teaches really simple. If you confess your sin, God's faithful. He's just. He'll forgive your sin. But if you won't confess your sin, you just want to hang on to your sin and say, oh, my sin's not really a sin. I got news for you. You're, you're making a false confession. Call your sin what it is. In fact, we're going to take communion now to, to conclude the, the, the study today. But before we do, I have to be very clear with you. The... When Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, a very carnal church, they were kind of sinning here and there, you know, not about different areas. And he wrote to them and he said, guys, um, I, I have some news for you. You guys are, are, are coming together to have your love feast and stuff and you're taking communion. And I, I've, I've heard word he said that some of you are even um, sick and some have even fallen asleep. When they took communion. What does he mean by falling asleep? That's an old Bible term. They, they, they died. They took, com they took communion. It said flippantly. Like not with the sincerity. And so Paul. When he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23. He says. This is what I write to you. He says. For what I receive from the Lord. Is that which I deliver to you. By the way. These are always the best things I've ever heard. In my Christian experience is when someone who's sharing is saying, let me share with you what God has showed me. Not something what I don't know. 
but what he has personally. Now, was, oh, by the way, was uh, those of you Bible students, tell me, was Paul the apostle at the, the table with the 12, you know, at the Last Supper? No. Some people don't realize this because, you know, there, there's like 11, there's 12, but Judas hung himself, and they think, well, Paul's the 12, but they forget. Paul didn't get put in to the club until later when he was actually out persecuting Christians and killing them and having them arrested and beaten and stoned. And he, he went from being a persecutor to a proclaimer of the faith. And he says that Christ himself showed him something. And I want you to listen to what Christ showed him. He said that Jesus, the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for who? For you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper. And he said, this is a cup of a new covenant in my blood. He said, do this as often as you drink it. So often as you will, the kingdom says, in remembrance of who? Of him. As often as you drink this, eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, when we take communion, what we're doing is we're actually proclaiming Christ died. We're just saying, hey, guys, in case you didn't know, Christ came and died. He became our substitute. He shed his blood. He let his body be broken as a i mean really they beat on him my wife can't watch that movie the passion you know what mel gibson made she said it's too gory it's too i i she knows christ died for her very tender-hearted i was a not a good kid growing up sometimes you know fighting was like second nature to me and when i read the account what josephus recorded about jesus how they beat him beyond it says beyond recognition of a man in fact the romans were so vehement against him they had felt like this guy has made our lives miserable they whipped him so so harshly on the backside what they don't record this in the scripture that they actually took jesus and turned him to the whipping post this way and beat the other side and, it, and Josephus records that his flesh was all torn away and that you could see the, the, the sinews, the, the meat, like raw hamburger, hanging through the skin. They had beaten him so severely. And I'm sorry if you're tender and this bothers you, but to me, Paul says that he received from the Lord that he, he took this bread what we're going to take up. Would you, would, I, would you guys please hand out the elements for communion right now? And, uh, and he t he's going to take a cup and he's going to tell them, this is my body. My body. It's broken for you. And as often as you want to take communion, you're allowed to take communion. You could be with your family at the, say you go out to lunch after, after church. You're sitting there and you, you're like, we got some time. You know, I just want to give thanks that God gave us his son. You men, by the way, you're supposed to be the priest of your house, so I want to invite you to step up to this role. You can just right there at the table, you know, when the waitress brings some bread to the table and say, could you, could you bring some, some wine or some juice for us? We're going to do communion while we're waiting for th This restaurant gives us plenty of time. You know, you know the restaurants that take forever. Just take communion. It'll kill some time, and you'll... And what you don't realize you're doing is you're proclaiming his death. People around you will be going, whoa, they're doing communion over there. They might even ask you, why did you do communion? And you can tell them because we're only going to take of communion until we, until we see the Lord, right? Once we see the Lord, we're done. But until he comes, we get to take communion. We're proclaiming he died. Now, how many sins did he die for today? All. And when you're talking to your friends, you need to remind them all includes their sin, too. Not just you, O holier than thou. I know some people, that's how they act when they, I'm the one taking communion. I'm the spiritual one. But, you know, those guys, they don't count. Well, listen, Paul says, I learned this from Jesus, that I can do this as often as I want. And, it, and all I'm doing is proclaiming Christ died for my sins. For all of our sins. And then he says, therefore, he says, whoever eats of this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner 
eats, it, it says he'll be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man, it says, first examine his neighbor. Right? No, I'm sorry, typo. No, it doesn't say that. It says, let a man first examine who? Himself. And in so doing, then he will eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, Paul wrote, many of you are weak and sick and a number sleep or are dead. But if we judge ourselves rightly, he says, then we will not be what? Judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, it says, it says, when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with this world. You know, any judgment is coming only from God. And he's doing it so we won't be condemned with the world. He might have to straighten you up in an area in your life that you become deceived in. And one of the things that's sobering for my spirit, but think about this. They had people actually taking communion back then. They, were, they would take communion flippantly like, I don't need to judge myself. Who cares if I'm in sin? It doesn't matter. Should you take communion if that's your attitude? If, I, if you would do me a favor, if that's your attitude, don't take communion today. Because we haven't laced our communion with anything. There's nothing. There's just grape juice and a matzo cracker. But let me tell you, I serve a living God. And if you try to fool him, he can, he can judge you. He, he's a fair judge. And it, but he doesn't want to. Con Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn you. I came to what? To save you. And the only person you have to judge in order to not be judged. I love this. You, you actually get to judge one person in your own life. The only one. Who is it? Yourself. In fact, this is the only one you should ever pay attention to judging. You should look into your own heart and examine yourself. Lord, is there anything I'm doing in me that is displeasing to thee? Anything I'm doing that's not right in your sight that just, you know, and before we take of communion this morning, I want you to pray this with me. That we, we ask the Lord, show us. You know, because we're all works in progress. Hopefully every time you take communion, there'll be something that the Spirit of God will be um, fine-tuning in you. It could be just subtle. Some of you are going, forget subtle. I got a whole bunch of big sins. Okay, well, that's fine. As long as you judge who? You. And when I say examine yourself, I mean just do this for me. Don't try to say my sin is not sin because that's not judging yourself rightly. You have to call sin what it is. It, in your own life, don't soften it. Don't try to hide it. Don't. It, it will just hurt you if you do that. Instead, just say, Lord, sorry, I've sinned. Sinned in whatever area his spirit convicts you of. You know, maybe you were a jerk to your neighbor. Maybe you were short with your spouse. Maybe you have a, um, loose lips or maybe you swear too much. You know what your sin is. The Spirit of God, by the way, I never have to do this job because it says the Holy Spirit convicts all of us concerning our sin. What we have to do then is yield to that conviction. When, when His Spirit says, stop doing this, I want to set you free. See, because the Bible says, he whom the Son sets free is what? Free indeed. I want you to be freed from the things that are holding you back. And it's our sin that holds us back. The, the psalmist wrote, It is my sin what has separated me from who? From thee, O God. You know, wh when we sin and we feel like, man, God feels far away today. Did God move? Has he changed his address? No. What has happened that makes him feel far away? Look inward. You'll find the answer. Today we can take care of that. And by the way, if you'd like to take care of that like real good so you don't feel that distance, do this with me. Let's examine our own hearts. Before we take of this bread in remembrance of the Lord, let's pray together and ask God to show us what he wants to have us confess to him. You're not going to confess out loud to us, just to him. 
your sin. But I don't want you to say it's not sin when it is. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. We have such a privilege. We can gather here in the open in Hawaii and we can celebrate the gift that you gave of your son. The bread of life, Lord, that has come down from heaven to give us everlasting life. We, we thank you for this good news. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. And we pray now that you would help us, Lord. Help us to be a people that would examine our own lives, our own hearts. Lord, if there's something we're doing displeasing to you, may your spirit just quicken us, Lord, in those areas. May you just bring those to our remembrance and let us confess it to you that we can, we can celebrate the verses we've studied this morning, knowing if we confess to you that you're faithful and just to forgive us. But not just to forgive, Lord, but to cleanse. We need your cleansing, Lord. We ask you, forgive us now our sin, whatever the sin may be. If it's just our anger or our hot temper, or our pride, Lord, whatever the area we wrestle with, Forgive us, Lord. We confess to you. Just take this moment and confess to him your sin before we partake together. And Jesus, Matthew 26, 26 tells us, in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. Just very similar to this bread, probably not as fancy with pinholes. And, but it was a Jewish unleavened bread called matzah like this. It's an unleavened bread, meaning the leaven is the sin, no sin involved. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. I want you to take this matzah cracker and just break it. And this is just to remember, he let himself be that sacrifice broken for you. He said, do this in remembrance of me. So, Lord Jesus, in remembrance of you, being the bread of life which has come down from heaven, we partake of this. Forgive us our sins now. Refresh us. Give us what we need from your spirit. In your name we pray. And everyone that agree with me said, amen. Let's partake. And thankfully and very wisely, after the bread, which is really dry, he took the cup. I need a bigger cup than this. I need a cup like this. Real cup. But he took the cup and he said, this is a cup of new covenant in my blood. This is shed for the remission. Um, big Christian word for the complete removal. He wants to remove your sin. And that's why he gave his blood, that w our sin would be washed, though it be like scarlet, be white as snow. Lord, thank you for giving your blood. To you we say salute. In Hebrew they say lahaim, to life. You being our life, Lord, thank you for this. Forgive us. Wash us clean. Now I want you to stand with me. Keep the, the stuff rolling, guys. And I want to sing this song that we just looked at, the verse from Isaiah. And the, if you need the words, they're in your song sheet. But it's also in your Bible, Isaiah 118. White as snow. How many of you confess to the Lord this morning a sin? Don't, don't tell me it out loud. I'm not, I'm not asking for volunteers. I'm just saying, anyone here confess besides me your sin? The pastor that mentored me, John Higgins, he would always, it's such a really, you know how the older guys are real comforting? He would say, I have some news for you. Just want to start off your week this week. All you that confess your sins, raise your hand again. And you go like this, and you look around. Okay, everyone with your hands raised up, I just want to tell you something to start off your week. If you confess your sin, the God I serve has forgiven your sin. In the, in the name of who? Jesus, his son. So he would say, I have the best news to start off your week. Your sin is what? 
forgiven. Now, he wasn't doing it like in my Catholic upbringing where the priest was acting like he was the one doing the forgiveness. He was saying, God has forgiven. And as far as east is from west, in a straight line, that's how far he took your sin and removed it from you. Another psalm says he cast it into the sea of what? Since we have an ocean, <laughs> sea of forgetfulness. Never to be remembered. If you said, God forgive me this morning, God went, poof, gone, done. And I get the privilege. You talk about a good job. I mean, this what, what cooler job could there be in the world than to proclaim to people that said, God forgive me. I get to, I get to tell you, mm -hmm. he did. Like, I didn't, not, not like I'm doing it for him. I'm just telling you, just to reassure you. Did he forgive? Yes. yes. How clean is your slate this morning? White to start snow. off, white as snow, right? White as snow, white as snow. Though my sin would as scarlet, Lord, I know, yes, Lord, I know. That I may have forgiven through the power of your love, through the wonders of your love, through faith in you, I know that I can be, I can be white. Okay, this is just getting ready for your week. White as snow, white as snow. Oh, my sins were as scarlet, Lord. I know, yes, Lord, I know that I'm being forgiven through the power of How clean are you? White as snow. White as snow. Start off this week knowing that it'll it will help your week go better. If you just remember, Jesus' forgiveness, he cleanses how many of how many sins? All. All. So your sins are cleansed. Start off this week in a great note. And and you know, if you should slip, do you have to wait till Saturday for confession? <laughs> no. My advice to you is confess right away. Lord, sorry I slipped up. And receive that forgiveness so you can continue walking in that. My wife's looking past me like just a whale. Not sure. That would be a nice way to end, huh? Whales, there she blows. No? Oh, well, we'll just start putting. You know what's interesting? The, the guys that help set up, or set up in the morning, we get treated to dolphin shows, whale shows. Some of you are like, I didn't get to see any pastor. I'm like, come a little earlier. <laughs> or stay a little later. The, 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 remember last week, the end crew? We're just finishing putting the, the tarp on the trailer, and we get s treated to a show. I think God is just winking to all those servants. You know, we have a lot of servants in this fellowship behind the scenes. And for all of you, I'm grateful for you that you helped me to do this because this is a privilege to me to get to share the word of God like this out in the open and say, you know, maybe someone who doesn't, wouldn't go into church gets to hear us. And I know the young men dancing over there and the, doing their, their, their practice for the show up north Two of them used to live, come basically my Hanai boys. They lived in our house growing up, and 
they always try to wait till I'm done to do the drumming. Did you notice that? They're, they're, they were real soft until I got finished and then started up. Because they're very respectful. They're, they're, they love the Lord too. And, and this, you know, this message might be just needing a few of their group to hear you know, that the Lord could let them know. So go in that knowledge. You know, when someone says, how's your week? Well, started off on a good note. Got all my sin washed. <laughs> cleansed, you know. Slate clean. And they're like, what? No, really, man. Went to church and the pastor just laid it out. That's uh, The good news is how much sin? All. So go in that comfort. Have a blessed week in the Lord. If you need prayer, go under the uh, blue tent here. Uh, Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.